Welcome to The Walker. My name is Yesa Mimolu, and I'm joined by my colleague here, Susie Bilak, to introduce proceedings today. Um, I'm so happy to see um, friends, collaborators, and new faces in the audience joining us for today's Blackboard conversation with Sharon Hayes, Avery Gordon, Karen Merza, and Brad Butler. Um, developed as part of programming around the exhibition, The Museum of Non-Participation, The New Deal, which you are currently sitting in, um, this event follows on from the opening night performance, The Exception and the Rule, which we were glad to host also in the gallery um, on Thursday night. And um, for, for those of you who were here on Thursday, you know it was quite an event, so we're going to try and live up to that a little bit. Um, so what does it mean to name and define not only a body of work, but a political or philosophical position, an artistic practice or relationship to, wider social, or to a wider social context? These are questions propelling the Museum of Non-Participation. Through the very act of naming and identifying their ongoing project under the concept of non-participation, Merza and Butler activate a collective process of inquiry around this inherently malleable and expansive term. As non-participation surfaces in our daily lives, Merzer and Butler assert that rather than being a position of negation or denial, it is a position from which to speak. In various ways, this iteration of um, the artist's fictional museum aims to open up a variety of frames within which we can understand non-participation. This is already present in the installation, um, not only through the variety of um, audiovisual works that, that are on view, but through a collection of texts called Acts of Definition and Redefinition, which is specifically commissioned um, for this presentation of the museum. And um, it invites contributors um, who are based in Minneapolis and also inter international collaborators of the artists to situate non-participation across various geographies, histories, and perspectives. So that's just um, at the back of the room and it's part of the installation. I encourage you to read through it um, if you get a chance today or whenever you're back into this space. And um, this idea of offering different perspectives was also enacted on Thursday night through the participants um, who took part in our um, political theater presentation and also the audience who were kind of um, active spect actors. So by inviting multiple voices to address non-participation within the context of personal and professional lives or thinking on the convergences of art and political practice, we aim to bring the expansive and collaborative spirit of Merz and Butler's practice into literal acts of definition. So this event that we're here for today is positioned specifically to put the Museum of Non-Participation, the New Deal, into context. So it's not through an appraisal of individual works that make up the exhibition, but rather through a deep reflection on the overall concept that's guiding this ongoing project. Today you're going to experience the responses that we've invited from New York-based artist Sharon Hayes and from writer Avery Gordon, both of whose practices speak on multiple tiers to non-participation. Avery will present a letter directed or written directly to Karen Mirza and Brad Butler through the lens of the Hawthorne archives. Sharon Hayes will consider non-participation and the status of the detainee within the context of the collaborative piece, Nine Scripts from a Nation at War. Before sharing more on our guests, who we're delighted to have here today, uh, a little bit of housekeeping. So first thanks, we want to give thanks to Robert and Rebecca Polad for their generous support of this exhibition. We also want to give special thanks to the British Council for making this event today possible. Our program is being recorded, and while we're amplified, this is going to turn into a, a discussion, a lively one, we hope. And so when you speak, please project your voice so that the event that's being recorded for posterity and will eventually go onto the Walker Channel um, will be heard. Uh, the structure of event is going to go like this. We're going to have two presentations, after which it's going to open up into a conversation. And that will be a conversation between our guests, between the artists, ourselves, and all of you, we hope. Um, so now on to give a little bit more context to our guests. So Avery Gordon is a writer and educator who teaches at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And she is a visiting fellow, fac faculty fellow at the Center for Research Architecture, Department of Visual Cultures at Goldsmiths, London. In 2012, she was the Anna Maria Kellen Fellow at the American Academy in Berlin, where she worked on a collaborative project with Ines Schaber um, that was exhibited at Documented 13. She's the author of Notes for the 
Bretonneur Room of the Workhouse, a project by Ines Schreber and Avery Gordon, Keeping Good Time, Reflections on Knowledge, Power, and People, and Ghostly Matters, Haunting and the Sociological Imagination. Since 1997, Gordon has co-hosted No Alibis, a weekly public affairs radio program on KCSB 91.9 FM Santa Barbara. She is also the keeper of the Hawthorne archives. Sharon Hayes' work moves between multiple mediums, video, performance, installation, and an ongoing investigation into the interrelation between history, politics, and speech. She employs conceptual and methodological approaches borrowed from practices such as performance, theater, dance, anthropology, and journalism. Her work has been shown at venues such as the New Museum for Contemporary Art, the Guggenheim, PS1 Contemporary Art, and the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, as well as the Tate Museum in London, the Museo Reina Sofina in Madrid, Museum Moderner Kunst, and the Generali Foundation in Vienna, as well as the Deutsche Guggenheim in Berlin, and 45 lesbian living rooms across the United States. Hayes is an assistant professor at the School of Art at Cooper Union. Please join us. <laughs> uh <laughs> so please join us in welcoming our guest, our guest today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that nice introduction. And um, what I'm going to read sounds as if I'm not here, um, but I am here. So um, I'm looking forward to having the conversation afterwards, even though it sounds like I'm not actually here, but I am. Did you pass out the letters? OK. Um, That would be good, okay. Um, Dear Karen and Brad, I write to respond to your recent inquiries. To answer your first question, the Hawthorne Archive holds many collections on the long traditions of non-participation, including on boycotting people, places, countries, businesses, things, buses, relationships, extra work, and too many meetings. We also collect on work, tax, debt, bank, sex, gender, school, testing, and hunger strikes, including the often insufficiently credited teenage strike against the family dinner. Also covered are not voting, not watching television, not speaking, not answering questions, not going to work today or tomorrow, not driving, not banking, not dieting, not listening to authorities, not social networking, not doing what you're told, not thinking what you're told to think, not being who you're told you are, not being who you're told to be. Disobeying the rules, not shooting, shouting not in our name, refusing to show up, exposing secrets you're supposed to maintain, keeping secrets they would like to possess, bartering, unauthorized and feral trading, creating your own money, theft, piracy, banditry, sabotage, giving things away for free, being absent without official leave, deserting, running away, marinage, separatism, resettlement. The range of actions, inactions, thoughts and unthoughts that might constitute non-participation recognized by the archive is, as you can see, varied and extensive. However, it should be noted that the Hawthorne Archive, named after the witch's tree, is not a library or a research collection in the conventional sense. We are an autonomous living archive, assuming different forms and assembling relationships with individuals and other entities as needed or desired. The answer to your second question is yes, and enclosed you will find a small contribution to the temporary installation of the Museum of Non-Participation at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The Hawthorne Archive holds a special place for runaways, for those who run away from slavery and indenture, from war and conscription, from oppressive states and state-making projects, from bad families and bad homes, 
from the promises of civilization and its correctional technologies and from being ruled by others. Attached is a document, um, an additional document on social de soldier desertion, which may interest you. Since we treat running away as a type of political non-participation, we thought the enclosed items about fugitives in Minneapolis and St. Paul might be appropriate for your museum. Instructions for the return of these items are included. If you have further questions, please reply directly to me. Best wishes and solidarity, Avery Gordon, keeper of the Hawthorne Archives. Item. The Winslow House Visitor Log for July 12, 1860. Colonel Richard Christmas, Mrs. Richard Christmas, their child and nurse, arrive with a large number of other Mississippians. They say Eliza Winston was the second of three slaves to escape between August and early October in 1860. They must mean that she was the second of the three reported in the newspapers to have publicly requested their emancipation before the local courts. Joseph Farr, a boatman who came to St. Paul in 1850 at age 18 and worked with his uncle, the barber William Taylor, remembers the good many runaways they met and helped, including the nameless girl who was hidden in the ice cream shop on Fifth Street until her homesickness became too great. Or the fine-looking, well-dressed young fellow who was a girl and cried and cried when he, she got off the boat but then showed her mettle by trusting a Frenchman who hid in the woods, who hid her in the woods, not too far from his house for a couple of weeks until he, she could make her way to Canada via Chicago. Item, Minneapolis State Atlas, 22 August, 1860. A chattel asks for freedom. Usually there's a lot of walking involved but Eliza came to St. Anthony on the riverboat with Colonel Richard Christmas, a planter from Mississippi. He says that normally he didn't bring his slaves with him during his regular summer visits, but his wife was sick and needed Eliza to look after her and the seven-year-old child. The habeas corpus examination that was held on the 21st of August on the second floor of the Hennepin County Courthouse and presided over by Judge Charles Vanderberg was chaotic and crowded with political agitators. The late afternoon hearing was brief. Citing the 1857 Supreme Court decision in Dred Scott v. Sanford, which extended the rights and enforcements given to slave owners in the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act, the colonel's lawyers argued that he retained his property rights in Eliza in whatever state he visited or lived. The lawyer claimed both rights and chattel were the colonel's personal possessions. Eliza's lawyer, the abolitionist Francis Cornell, replied simply by quoting from Article 1, Section 2 of Minnesota's relatively recent state constitution. There shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude in the state, he said. Taken and sworn on the 24th of August, 1860, Eliza Winston's deposition was validated by the judge and she confirmed by voice her preference for, quote, freedom in Minnesota to lifelong slavery in Mississippi. The judge, Cornell's law partner, by the way, then declared Eliza Winston, quote, free to go where and with whom she pleased, the limits of said freedom remaining, as usual, unstated. The colonel took the verdict in stride. Several newspapers report that he assured his sympathizers that he had, quote, plenty more of them in Mississippi. Item, Eliza Winston's sworn statement given to J.F. Bradley, Justice of the Peace, Hennepin County, and published in the Falls Evening News of 28 August, 1860. By this craft, we have wealth. There was an important local dimension to this general statement about the political economy of slavery made by Jane Swisshelm, the militant white abolitionist and journalist who established four anti-slavery newspapers in her lifetime. It was simple, really. Wealthy Southern tourists from Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, Tennessee, and Missouri, escaping the summer heat, 
rode comfortable steamboats upriver and brought with them their enslaved valets, maids, nurses, and cooks. Minnesota's constitution prohibited slavery and indenture, but many benefited from the profitable tourist industry. White Minnesotans argued and fought among themselves about this situation, the details of which matter little to us. In general, some Minnesotans wished they too could openly hold slaves. Others tolerated slavery in their so-called free state with greater or lesser degrees of conscience. And a small number of radical white abolitionists kept up an anti-slavery direct action campaign. Where the indigenous Sioux stood in this conflict, we do not know. The 1862 uprising had related, but, did, but other causes. Apologists and Republican liberals alike hated the radicals and vilified them as fanatics. The specter of John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry and armed rebellion only, only 10 months earlier hovered uneasily even this far north. Item, advertisement. William Taylor, barber and hairdresser, has built and fitted up a shaving saloon on 3rd Street next door west of the new post office in St. Paul, up to the increasing luxury, style, and elegance of the growing metropolis of Minnesota, where he will be very happy to serve citizens and strangers in St. Paul in every branch of his business according to the best of his ability. June 5, 1851. They were prepared for her arrival. William Taylor, James Highwayden, another barber, young Farr, and the cook, David Edwards, had been successfully stowing away and sneaking off fugitives from the steamboats for quite some time. They had a man on the river named Eugene Berry, and he used to take care of the runaways coming out of Galena, the hub between St. Louis and St. Paul. Their agent up at Galena was a man named Johnson, and as Farr tells it, he used to get up to all kinds of schemes to get the slaves away, disguising them as well as he could and getting them aboard the Dr. Franklin, where Barry would take charge and stow them away among the freight. It was so much easier and safer for folks to ride on the boats than walk the long distance with all its hazards of recapture, hunger, frost and snake bite, and broken feet. This was surely one reason why the sensible and strategic Emily Gray never joined any of the white abolitionist societies. All their noisy protests at the dock only drew attention where it wasn't needed. It was perfectly obvious from the signs that they were happy to serve strangers and citizens in every branch of their business. They were prepared for her arrival. Eliza Winston met Emily Goodridge Gray, a free black seamstress an avid kitchen gardener, who was 26 at the time in St. Anthony, where Mrs. Gray and her husband, Ralph Toyer Gray, another barber, lived and worked since 1857 on Main Street at Jared House. They could see the Winslow House in the distance from their backyard. Emily was the daughter of the remarkable and somewhat flamboyant barber and builder William C. Goodridge, a well-known abolitionist activist in York, Pennsylvania, her birthplace. Emily and Ralph Gray were politically active in the anti-slavery movement, and Frederick Douglass counted Ralph, who is remembered as a fine public speaker, as a, quote, personal friend. Mind, it should be noted that Douglass, all honors due, was a politician and had many so-called personal friends. Emily introduced Eliza to Mrs. Gates, the abolitionist who arranged for the complaint, and it was a good thing, too, that Emily went out to Lake Harriet with the sheriff in his 30-man armed escort, because otherwise Eliza, fearing that the move from Winslow House to Mrs. Thornton's was prompted by suspicions of her impending escape, really needed to see a friendly face. Among the free black men and women who ran the underground, so many were barbers and seamstresses. We shouldn't forget Barber William Armstrong, who had a shop in the old St. Charles Hotel at Marshall and Wood Streets in Minneapolis, or Callie House, the Tennessee seamstress who later during Reconstruction founded the National Ex-Slave Mutual Relief Bounty and Pension Association. In the barber shops, men could openly love to gossip, arrange music gigs, and handle other music. 
which was especially useful in Minneapolis, where a surprising number of barbers were also musicians, including William Taylor himself, who was a popular violin player and singer around town, owing at least in small part to his being rather handsome. In the barber shop, men could gather and sharpen razors without undue scrutiny or visible political purpose. The seamstresses followed another assemblage, moving politely, gracefully, fashionably between domestic social worlds, carrying needles and secrets sewn in the lining of good dresses. They were prepared for her arrival. They read and they talked among themselves and they welcomed strangers to the best of their ability. Item. A photograph of cotton pickers in Paluski County, Arkansas, taken by Ben Sean in 1935 for the Farm Security Administration Office of War Information. The young woman in the center reminds me of Lois's friend Mildred, the one she spent her days off with, who smoked and drank and leaned forward when she smiled at me with shrewd, laughing eyes. They were prepared for her arrival. She was prepared for their assistance. Eliza Winston was 30 years old when she came to Minneapolis. They said her, quote, round, full black face showed signs of a rough life and that she cussed sometimes. This face is familiar. We know this story, too, of being an object of property and subject to lying promises and extravagant theft. The Liberia part is more distinctive and tragic. My name is Eliza Winston. I was held as the slave of Mr. Golson of Memphis, Tennessee, having been raised by Mr. Macklemo, father-in-law of Mr. Golson. I married a free man of color who hired my time off my master, who promised me my freedom upon payment of $1,000. My husband and myself worked hard, and he invested our savings in a house and a lot in Memphis, which was held for us in Mr. Golson's name. This house was rented for $8 a month. My husband went away with the company of emancipated slaves to Liberia and was to stay two years. When he returned, my master was to take our house and give me my free papers, my husband paying the balance due in money. My husband died in Liberia, and Mr. Golson got badly broken up in money matters and having pawned me to Colonel Christmas for $800, died before he could redeem me. I was never sold. I will say also that I have never received one cent from my property at Memphis since my husband died. When Mr. Golson married Mr. McElmo's daughter, I went with the young mistress. I became the slave of Mr. Christmas seven years ago last March. They have often told me I should have, ha I should have my freedom, and they at last promised me that I should have my free papers when their child was seven years old. This time came soon after we left home to come to Minnesota. I had not much confidence that they would keep their promise, for my mistress has always been feeble. And owing to the poor health of my mistress, I have been very closely confined, have had scarcely any time to myself or to see the other slaves. But I had heard that I should be free by coming to the North, and I had, with my colored friends, made all the preparations which we thought necessary. I had got a little money and spent it in clothes. My colored friends gave me some good clothing, and I came away with a good supply of clothing in my trunk, sufficient to last me two years and of a kind suitable to what we supposed this climate would be. After I got to St. Anthony, I got acquainted with a colored person, that's Emily Gray, and asked her if there were any persons who would help me in getting my freedom. I thought I had a right to my clothes, because I did not come from the master or mistress, and I purposed to carry away at different times when I should not be suspected some portion of them. I fixed upon the coming Sunday when I would leave. Eliza didn't leave that Sunday, but later, almost three weeks later, after the colonel moved the family and Eliza to Thornton House on Lake Harriet. The hearing was brief, but chaotic and crowded with agitators. After the court hearing, the pro-slavery owner of the Winslow House, C.W. McLean, provoked concerted gang raids on William King's State Atlas newspaper offices at Ralph and Emily 
Gray's house in St. Anthony and at William Babbitt's house, where an armed and very pregnant Mrs. Babbitt fought back with the help of her neighbor, Daniel Elliott, who was very badly beaten. The violence against the persons, homes, and printing presses of the abolitionists went on for days, with lawyer Babbitt the target of pernicious sabotage and name calling. They called him Eliza in the street, as if it were an insult. On October 19, Eliza Winston gave a short speech to the Hennepin County Anti-Slavery Society. Between August 21st and October 19th, we presume, we presume she was resting. Well, we do. <laughs> but I'm missing a piece of paper. <laughs> Here, excuse me. Between August 21st and October 9th, we presume she was resting, maybe at the home of the agent known as Professor Stone, where Babbitt had taken her during the white riots after the hearing, possibly also collecting the clothes she had meticulously gathered and whose whereabouts concerned her. After that, we don't know. She said she wanted to return to her house in Memphis and work as a nurse, marrying again a free colored man if she could. War was declared six months later. The Confederate soldiers came after Emily's father with a vengeance, scattering her three brothers, all photographers, to Michigan. They were prepared for that too. Item, the bell rack. Contraption used by an Alabama slave owner to guard a runaway slave. This rack was originally topped by a bell, which rang when the runaway attempted to leave the road and go through foliage or trees. It was attached around the neck, as shown in the picture. A belt passed through the loop at the bottom to hold the iron rod firmly fastened to the waist of the wearer. In the photograph, Richbord Galliard, assistant to the director of the Federal Museum, and also a well-known well young Alabama artist, poses to show the use made of the bell rack. No one dared keep records especially forged ones illegally written twice over by a slave. You could get the bell. When we got about halfway to St. Michael's, Frederick Douglass writes, while the constables having us in charge were looking ahead, Henry inquired of me what he should do with his pass. I told him to eat it with his biscuit and own nothing. And we passed the word around, own nothing, own nothing, and own nothing, said we all. Our confidence in each other was unshaken. We were resolved to succeed or fail together. We were now prepared for anything. Item, a photograph of the knees and feet of a couple of cotton pickers standing in the road in Lehigh, Arkansas, taken by Russell Lee in September 1938 for the Farm Security Administration Office of War Information. Usually there's a lot of walking involved but not always. Always, nonetheless, there is preparation. Preparation for being a fugitive, preparation for fugitive justice, preparation for something else than being stranded between grief and grievance. Slaves and captives always run towards freedom, a flawed, too late to make it right freedom, in a context in which it is a criminal act to imagine yourself as something other than their property or a property over which they have dominion. Slaves and captives always run towards a flawed, too late to make it right freedom in a context in which it is a criminal act to run, to move, to take off, to do anything whatsoever without their permission. It can happen in an overdetermined instant or be slowly plotted, like Setha, who recognized a man's hat and heard little hummingbird wings and said, no, 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 before she flew, or like Eliza, methodically squirreling away clothes for work and special days in a winter cold she could only imagine, patiently, repetitively waiting in the woods behind the house, after a while going back in, then going back out again, each time Mrs. Christmas heard someone approach the boarding house. It can happen in an overdetermined instant or be slowly plotted, but always there is preparation, hone knife sharp in the crucible of trying to live with all the ways they are always trying to kill us. Running away takes a lot of courage, 
thought and help from others to do it. Nobody runs without preparation. The preparation can be vague and disorganized or too managed to hold up in the end. It can be unfinished, so much still left to do. It can rely on friends and strangers whose motivations and skills won't always be dependable. The perfection can be perfect, but still you get caught. The quality of the preparation matters, especially if there's a lot of walking involved, because being in the preparation for something else marks the moment when their permission doesn't matter anymore, marks the moment when you'll never return, even if they take you back, marks the moment when the something else has to be next. Oh, nothing, oh, nothing, oh, nothing, said we all. We were now prepared for anything. Thank you, Avery, and thanks to everybody <clears throat> uh, here at the Walker, um, and also to Somi and Susie for that nice introduction. Let's see. Can I make sure? And uh, special thanks to Brad and Karen also for bringing me into um, <clears throat> an encounter with their work, which is a really um, deep privilege and, and um, wonderful opportunity for me. Um, you can maybe turn this projection off so we can sh shift a little bit. Um, the, in my own, uh, I'm gonna go between reading and talking, so, um, uh, what what um, what I want to do? I'll I'll also play you a little bit of audio in my own work. For those of you um, who may be familiar with it, I explicitly I don't explicitly use the word participation or non-participation. Although the work um, kind of embraces a, and engages a number of sort of behaviors or structures or conditions or events that um, that are held by those two terms. So it's been a kind of interesting operation for me to consider um, non-participation in particular and to try to find my way through, through what that means. I tend in my own work to frame uh, the operations of behaviors and structures and conditions and events in um, terms like normativity or non-normativity. I think very often what I do is, is to occupy a kind of given moment or a given uh, space non-normatively to uh, try to put resistance against a kind of normative um, regulations and structures and also to create a space for something in which something can happen. I also um, work a lot with uh, operations of anachronism and um, that's something that I just thought I would throw out at the beginning because it, it I think it could be interesting to think about um, texts, objects, pictures, speeches, that in being anachronistic and being out of temporal place um, end up performing a kind of non-participation. But um, that's not what I'm gonna do today. Um, I, I felt called, I think, by Brad and Karen's work and also by the urgency of the moment to talk about another project um, and, um, and that's what I'll sort of unfold today, which is a, a, a it's a public reading that took place inside of a collaboration. Um, as of today, the military administrators at the prison camp in Guantanamo Bay report that 63 of the 166 remaining detainees at Guantanamo are on hunger strike. Um, reporters and lawyers who have been working with um, detainees in Guantanamo and monitoring the situation there say that the numbers are much likely, much higher, um, that in fact it's possible that all the de remaining detainees are on some form of hu hunger strike um, in Guantanamo. Many people are probably aware of this and it's something that we can talk about um, in the discussion. 
Of course, as Avery brought up, the hunger strike, um, like many forms of political refusal, has a long and um, diverse history of actualization. In the case of Guantanamo, as in many of those other historic examples, what is so, um, I think, ar arresting uh, in, in the fact of that strike is that so many of the remaining detainees in participating in this active refusal to eat are, literally speaking, refusing to live under the conditions of, of their interminable, indefinite detention. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today in a very, very brief and condensed manner is a four and a half hour public reading that I co-organized with four other artists as part of a collaborative work called Nine Scripts from a Nation at War. My collaborators in this project, which is important to me to name because they aren't here right now, are Andrea Geyer, Ashley Hunt, Katya Sander, and David Thorne. Nine Scripts from a Nation at War itself was a really large and kind of sprawling project, and, and I'm not going to talk about that, but I do want to note that what I am going to talk about, which is the public reading called Combatant Status Review Tribunals, pages 2,954 to 3,064, a public reading, took place in a kind of larger project, so it had a context and was in dialogue with, um, with other uh, aspects of, of, in a general sense, what it meant, what positions were created for us. And I guess I'll, I'll leave that broad under, um, under and after 2003 and the US invasion of Iraq. I want to talk about this project primarily because the material um, that we were working with inside of the public reading, the transcripts of the combatant status review tribunals, or CSRTs, as they're colloquially called, held at the, military, the US military prison at Guantanamo Bay in Cuba between July 2004 and March 2005, which was this sort of first initial moment of, um, of these tribunals. Um, it's the transcripts that, that I'm interested in putting into our discussion and into, the, into a dialogue and discussion with the Museum of Non-Participation, the New Deal. The, trans the transcripts for me offer a kind of complex demonstrations of the conditions surrounding a set of uh, activities or enunciations that we could describe as participation and a set of multiple activities or enunciations that we could describe as non-participation. In the case of the CSRTs, I'm interested in uh, this field of non-participation as, as it includes um, active refusal, passive refusal, failed or unsuccessful participation, um, a kind of incomprehensibility, which I also think of having a lot to do with language and the ability to hear, listen, understand, um, absorb. And also, um, also what I think is present often in the, in the transcripts, which is maybe something I would call a kind of excessive compliance or an excessive participation that I think also uh, can act to disable the proceedings or to disable the forum that is present. What I want to do is um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to describe a couple of concrete things about the um, public reading, uh, which I co-organized, and also about the CRSTs. But before I did that, I thought maybe I should just jump in. So I'm going to play you an excerpt from the public reading. The, the reading exists as a performance of a sort. It's, a, it's an activity that happens over four and a half hours with a group of people reading. It also then exists as a video inside of a work. What I'm doing today is just playing the audio. Uh, it felt somehow in relation to all of the, um, the visual uh, sort of documents and materials we have present that maybe audio is, is a better way to send it into the conversation. So um, if you can play the um, Ashraf Salim in just a second. And what I'll do while I, while I do that is I, I'm just going to use what Brad and Karen have 
given us, which is a blackboard, actually. I'm going to just write up the name, the name of the de detainees whose CSRT I will be either playing. There are two that I'll play, uh, one, one in excerpt form and or um, reading from. There are some that I'll read from. So I'm just going to write the names in order of when you hear them, starting with um, Ashraf Salim Abd Al Salam Sultan. Summarized witness testimony. Ashraf Salim, you are hereby advised that the following applies during this hearing. You may be present at all open sessions of the tribunal. However, if you become disorderly, you will be removed from the hearing and the tribunal will... Detainee interrupts tribunal president before she could complete her sentence. Well, how would I disturb order? Becoming too emotional? No, I will never do any of that. Not listening to the tribunal? It was a warning, just in case. I just understood that, disturbing the order, that I am not going to be doing that. I'll start that sentence over. If you become disorderly, you will be removed from the hearing, and the tribunal will continue to hear evidence in your absence. You may not be compelled to testify at this tribunal. However, you may testify if you wish to do so. Your testimony can be under oath or not under oath. You may have the assistance of a personal representative at the hearing. Your assigned personal representative is present. You may present evidence to this tribunal, including the testimony of witnesses who are reasonably available and whose testimony is relevant to this hearing. You may examine documents or statements offered into evidence other than classified information. However, some documents may be partially masked for security reasons. Ashraf Salim, do you understand this process? Yes, I understand, uh, but I think some of these procedures are reasonable and others are not reasonable. Okay, so noted. Do you have any questions concerning the tribunal process? You know, we're getting into classified and unclassified. All this is just about me proving what I did. If I did the things I did, I would admit that I did. Uh, things I didn't do, I will say clearly I did not do them. But if the tribunal is saying there are classified things, classified information, they have to prove that. I'm not asking to see witnesses if you have any. I just need, I need just their names to prove that your documents are true. I think this is not justice if you accuse someone based on classified information. This is not justice. It is not right. It hasn't been witnessed in the whole human history. If you base your judgments or the accusations against me on classified information, then there is no need to continue. Let's stop right here. Ashraf Salim, I have classified information that is being presented by the government. If we release all of that information, it could cause harm to the national security of the United States. What harm or danger could you expect from someone in shackles who cannot even move like me? There is an opportunity later on in this process for you to communicate with your family or other people outside of this compound. If you have information that could harm the United States, we cannot release that information at this point. So if I want to help myself by bringing witnesses or documents of things that are outside this place, how can I do that? You had the opportunity to ask for witnesses. Personal representative, did you offer the detainee the opportunity to ask for witnesses? Yes, ma'am. Mm, that is true. The representative told me I could contact witnesses, but I had to go through the representative. I refuse that. I want to talk to my witnesses personally. The only way that you can ask for a witness is through the personal representative. We must involve the U.S. government to communicate with your government to find the witness. Mm, I guess they will not contact these people, but will imprison them. As far as I know, in all the history of the human race, I don't think there have been any tribunals of this form or of this kind. You did swear to do your job rightfully and just. Unfortunately, now you're just following orders or a predetermined way of conducting this tribunal. Ashraf Salim, you are correct. There is a higher authority, and we have to follow the rules of this tribunal. 
I cannot change the rules of this tribunal. Right now, you have the op option of participating in this tribunal or not participating. I will participate under one condition. I want to be allowed to talk personally to the witnesses. You control the forum, but I want to talk to the pers witnesses personally. For me to give you the name and the numbers of somebody I know soon, I will see that person here, next to me. Ashraf Salim, you do have the option of communicating with a witness to the U.S. government. That is the only option. I know my fate is already predetermined and the judgment has been pronounced already, so this tribunal is just for show and it is not real. Everybody is reading from papers that were already printed and everything is already predetermined. I know for sure my destiny is already determined. The judgment against me is already made up. My presence, me defending myself or not defending myself, will have no importance whatsoever. Ashraf Salim, we have not seen any classified information. We will base our decision on unclassified and classified information. If you want to have a witness here, we will allow for a witness. But we have to make a decision right now on whether you want to participate or you do not want to participate. Ashraf Salim, I will ask you one more time. Do you want to participate in this tribunal? One thing, this unclassified document, what the personnel representative told me, showed me, or is it something else? Yes, that is the unclassified summary of evidence. There is no proof of all of this, so give me the proof. You have sworn to be fair and just, but again, don't just go by what is given you. You have to go by, by what's right and correct. Ashraf Salim, you have the opportunity to give us your statement. If you don't want to give us a statement right now, then we will stop this proceeding and allow you to go back to your room. Before I answer this question, I'd like to ask you one more question. The classified information is going to stay classified until when? It will stay classified forever. I will not have a chance to look at the information? No. Nope. And there's no need for us to continue talking. This just means you've made your decision and that's it. Ashraf Salim. You're telling me that you've classified information or classified proof and that I'm not allowed to read it or see it? So where is the justice here? Ashraf Salim, do you want to participate in this tribunal? Yes or no? No. Under this way, no. I want to participate in a just way, not this way. This tribunal is in recess until the detainee can be removed. All rise. Okay, you can stop it. Um, so as I did that also, um, there were a handful of photos published from uh, Guantanamo of the, the scene of the tribunals themselves because of the performance on Thursday and the game of power, is that what it's called? And a discussion generally about um, sort of forms and, um, and these kind of uh, judicial and extra judicial moments. I thought it might be helpful to see then I can also tell you how we transformed it in the reading. So this, uh, as I understand it, is a, is a trailer. Um, there were a lot of them on, at Gitmo. Um, the, the, there's a, it's a rectangular space. Um, I'm gonna step off, off mic for a second. This seems to be, appears to be a two-way mirror because it shows up as a kind of framed square that is a mirror. So I assume that there's something over here, but I've never seen myself any documentation of what happens behind that mirror. This is the tribunal. There's a tribunal president, two tribunal members. I, I sort of mark these in gray because I'm not sure this has any relevance, but these are all sort of plush, <laughs> cushy, um, black seats. The tribunal president has a slightly larger seat than the other two tribunal members. This is a table um, with, for both the personal representative and the recorder. Um, there's a tape recorder, and then the blue marks also a, a certain kind of seat chair. Um, these are three additional chairs for, there are, was the allowance for uh, recorders to watch the proceedings. Um, and then this is where the detainee is placed with a, um, a clip at the bottom of the chair for the handcuffs to be cuffed to, so, and this is a sort of plastic white chair. This is then the same chair as this, um, and then a seat for a witness, potentially that the witness also is coming from 
and is a detainee at Guantanamo. So this is also a white chair with a, um, with a metal fixture to lock the handcuffs to. So um, I'm going to read a few excerpts from, I, I could tell you in my own words, I could tell you from what I've read, um, a history of the proceedings of the CSRTs, what uh, Paul Wolfowitz, who was the Deputy Secretary of Defense at the time and made the order to put the um, proceedings into play and I have in front of you and for our discussion can certain, certainly read you Wolfowitz's order as it was written and how the proceedings are supposed to go. But I also think it's interesting f to kind of consider these things from the transcripts themselves. So I'm just going to read a handful of excerpts and then I'll play the final, I'll tell you about the reading and play the final. So now from here, um, picking up from Mohammed Jawad, um, I'll just be reading excerpts from some of those detainees' CSRT proceedings. When asked by the tribunal president if the detainee understood the CSRT process, the detainee answered yes. When asked by the tribunal president if the detainee had any questions concerning the CRT process, the detainee answered, what kind of questions? Tribunal President, do you have any questions about why we are here and what we're going to do? Detainee, I have a question. Why am I here? Tribunal President, here in this tribunal? Detainee, I don't understand. Tribunal President, I'm asking if you have a question about why we are here today and what we are going to do here today. Detainee, you are here to find out if I'm a criminal or not. Tribunal President, we are not here to decide if you are a criminal. We are going to decide from information if you are an enemy combatant. Detainee, okay. Detainee, I would like to know who is president with us in this tribunal. Tribunal president, as identified, the tribunal members, the recorder, the reporter, the translator, and you know your personal representative. These other two gentlemen are journalists. Detainee. Reporters, tribunal president, yes, for this open session. Detainee, tell them welcome. Tribunal president, you have no objections that they attend this session? Detainee, no, I have no objections. But the commanders of the tribunal, do they have a background in law or law diplomas or are they just officers? Tribunal president, they are military officers and one is a judge advocate general, which is a military lawyer. Detainee. The others, do they know anything about the law? Tribunal president, we have a general knowledge of the military and the tribunal proceedings. Detainee, I'm a civilian. How can you try me in a military court? Under what basis? Tribunal president, this is not a legal proceeding. This is an administrative hearing to determine your enemy combatant status. Detainee, good. Detainee, First, I want to know who are the members of this tribunal? Tribunal president, we are the tribunal, using a hand movement to her left and right panel. I am the tribunal president. Detainee, are you Americans? Tribunal president, yes, we are all Americans. Detainee, do you belong to the American military? Tribunal president, yes, we are all military members. Detainee, the American military is my adversary and all the laws require that the panel or board have to be a third party that is completely neutral and has nothing to do with the adversaries. Tribunal President, that may be true in a legal proceeding, but this is an administrative proceeding. Detainee, if the adversary is my judge, also I should not expect any justice uphold. Tribunal President, we are an impartial panel here to look at your enemy combatant status, and that's basically all I can tell you. Detainee, you are the same organization, so we cannot claim that you are neutral. Tribunal President, we are not here to debate these points. This proceeding is going to go on with you or without you. You are welcome to participate or not. That is your choice. Detainee, so what is the goal, the point for this session? Tribunal President, this panel looks at two things. Basically, the information provided by the recorder and then the oral statements that you will provide for us. We are charged at looking at those pieces of evidence and determining whether you have been classified as an enemy combatant. Detainee, I am not an enemy combatant because this definition is so broad that you cannot understand it. 
So according to their definition, and everybody could be an enemy combatant. First of all, I wasn't caught on American territory, and I wasn't fighting Americans. I was in another territory. So Americans are not my enemy, therefore. Tribunal President, you will get a chance to tell us your story in a few minutes, detainee. According to the definition, we can accuse anybody around the world, even thousands of miles away from the US, sleeping in his house anywhere in the world. So you can accuse me with whatever you want. Tribunal President, let me reiterate, we are not here to debate this issue. Detainee, I feel my right as being present to this tribunal to ask that they inquire about these things. Tribunal President, I told you all that I can tell you about the process. I'm not going to debate any further. Detainee, justice requires discussions. We cannot get to justice without discussions. Also, I wanted to have a lawyer who has knowledge about international law and laws. Tribunal President, I need to know at this point if you want to proceed. This is not a legal proceeding and you are not entitled to a lawyer. Detainee, I want to participate. I don't have a lawyer and I don't know about laws and justice, so you have to be open-minded. Personal representative, Ma'am, you, you might want to let him know you have not seen any of the evidence. Detainee, fine. When asked by the tri tribunal president that the detainee, the detainee stated he understood the CSRT process and did not have any questions. When the tribunal president asked if the detainee had any questions concerning the tribunal process, the detainee commented that he was concerned with the amount of time he was given to prepare for the process. Yesterday, I met with my personal representative for about two hours, and today I met for, with him for approximately 30 minutes. I feel for such a serious matter that could determine my fate, the system is flawed. I understand the wording from the script you have read, but I don't believe the script is straightforward. Detainee, should I speak? Tribunal President, as far as if you understand the process that we just described to you. Detainee, it's not fair for me if you mask some of the secret information. How can I defend myself? Tribunal President, the tribunal is an impartial panel that looks at two things. The things we take into account are the information that the recorder provides us. The second thing that we look at is the oral statement that you will provide today, we hope. We have to weigh both things. Detainee, I don't know what I should say. It is unfair that the government is going to be talking about me and I don't have an attorney, a civil attorney, and that attorney can't come up with evidence that proves my innocence. As all people who commit crimes, they have an attorney defending them. If that's the only thing we have to do, what else can I say? Tribunal President, I just want to remind you that this is an administrative process only. No punishment will be derived from the things that we do here today. Detainee, you are right, but the thing is that the, that, but the thing that is the worst punishment is when you have determined that I am guilty when I am not. I feel that anybody that comes before the tribunal is going to be classified as an enemy combatant. I'm not putting you down because I don't know you and you don't know me. I respect the tribunal, but the way it's formed is unjust. Tribunal president, we will note your concerns for the record. I would like to tell you, though, that we do look at each case on its own merits. So basically, at least what information I have given you, do you understand the process up to this point? Detainee, yes. Detainee, please tell me when it's my turn to speak because I don't know what's going on here. Tribunal president, we will tell you. I'll address you by name and the translator will let you know when it's your turn. Detainee, sure, no problem. Anytime my name is mentioned, I will start speaking. Detainee, anything to make you believe, I will do that. If it's your wishes for me to swear, I will do so. Tribunal President, it's up to you if you wish to. We will accept your oral statement either way. Detainee, anything to make you believe me, I will do it that way. I will present you with my verbal statement. Tribunal President, either way, it will be accepted. Detainee, if you tell me to swear, I will swear. If you tell me not to swear, I will not swear. I have witnesses all over my province. Tribunal President, we can't make that selection for you, so why don't we just proceed? Detainee, please start. Personal representative, when we met, 
we discussed that I would read these first and then you could say more. Do you still wish to do it that way? Detainee, what do you mean? What should I say? <clears throat> Tribunal president, I'll, um, the transcript note is, while the tribunal president explained the convening order to the detainee, the detainee stated he wanted his hands released. Tribunal president, that's not within our power to do that. Detainee, there is a big difference between the law and being brutal. Tribunal president, we are here only to discuss your enemy combatant status and the handcuffs will stay on. Detainee, before we start, I have a question for you. Tribunal president, certainly. Detainee, you bombed Afghanistan with 100,000 bombs and you are calling me an enemy combatant. What about yourself? Tribunal president, let's set the ground rules right now. We are here to talk about the allegations on the unclassified summary that has been shown to you and your enemy combatant status. That is the only thing we will discuss with you. That is the only thing within our power to discuss with you. Detainee, as far as I'm concerned, you are the enemy combatant. You should be going to court, not me. Tribunal president, this is the only warning I will give you. If we have to stop and talk about this some more, you will be escorted out of the room and we will continue in your absence. Detainee, is your point based on legal issues or is it your purpose to use force? Tribunal president, I don't understand the question. Translator to the tribunal president, the detainee was replying to what you had just suggested. If he doesn't obey the rules, he will not be allowed to participate here. Tribunal president, we will call the guards back in and remove you from the room. Detainee, I'm willing to obey, but you are the ones not obeying the law. Tribunal president, just remember the warning. We will stick with the purpose of the enemy combatant status, and that is all. Detainee, you asked your questions, and I have questions also. I am listening to what you have to say. Tribunal president, good, thank you. Detainee, do detainees of other nationalities have the same courts, or are they different? Tribunal president, all detainees receive the same tribunal with the exception of the translator with the appropriate language. Detainee, according to your laws, are we supposed to be in this court because we were captured in our own country? We were not captured elsewhere. Tribunal president, this has to do with enemy combatant status only. It doesn't matter where you're from. Detainee, this is not a court, this is stubbornness. You are doing this by force. Tribunal president, you have a choice not to be here. Detainee, I want to go to a court with freedom so I can speak my mind. Detainee, sorry, tri tribunal president, you will have the opportunity to do that today. Detainee, in the beginning you told me I couldn't speak in court. Tribunal president, I said you needed to confine your comments to the unclassified summary issues. Detainee, I will talk to you according to the law. Tribunal president, thank you. Detainee, you still have to answer my questions regarding the fact that we were ca captured as Afghans in our own country. We are not supposed to be enemy combatants. Why have you brought me here? There is a difference between us and them. If someone is caught in their own country, they shouldn't be enemy combatants. If they are caught in a different country, that person is an enemy combatant. Tribunal president, again, we are not here to debate that today. Detainee, that is not right. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to just play uh, the last little, little bit, just a small excerpt of, um, <clears throat> of another of the reading. Um, and one of the things that uh, I'll say very briefly with the reading is that um, the reading was staged in such a way that... Um, was interesting to us was that the, in essence, I think our question was actually about our own participation in these tribunals, our own participation in this case of a group of artists made up of four U.S., three U.S. citizens and two um, European citizens, and um, trying to understand our access through these transcripts, not, not our ability to access a kind of truth that happened at Guantanamo because we aren't given that. One of the things we became very aware of in here is what gets totally sort of 
wiped over, which is the role of translation and the role of the transcriber. So in essence, in the space of the, re in the space of the reading, we, had, we created a position that was the narrator. And we considered the narrator to be the position of the transcript, because clearly out of this voluminous number of transcripts, they were, tra audio tapes were transcribed by different people, and different choices were made about how that voice gets translated. And, um, and translated not only from language to language, which was the interpreter's job, but then translated onto the page into first person or third person, into a kind of interruption dialogue or summary. Um, so this position was an added position. We had the detainee here. We also had a chair for a witness that in the course of the uh, 18 tribunals that we read, there was no witness that was allowed to be called. Um, but it's a very kind of fraught position. This was translator. That's an almost silent voice in the transcripts. You almost never actually have the voice of the translator. This was um, personal rep. This was recorder, and then tribunal president, tribunal, we called it TP and TA, tribunal A and tribunal B. So just as I'm playing this now that you hear another excerpt, you'll have a sense of this. Um, audience then to the reading was behind all of these positions, um, sort of spread out throughout the room. and. Um, uh, and then also very, very significantly, because you're not going to hear it this time, we had a group of nine readers, um, and we didn't ask them to characterize the detainee. The idea was not to cast anybody in that role, to be precise about it in terms of a kind of characterization. It was to do what people had competency to do, which was to, as a reader, like transmit and, and bring those written transcripts to vocalization, to enunciation. So um, importantly, they never occupied one position. At each tribunal, they moved. So they would go from narrator to here, here to here, here to here, here to here, around to a kind of break position and then go back in. Um, so uh, the, the, re the reason I wanted to end with this excerpt um, it is interestingly, in the course of the four and a half hours, it is the same configuration that you heard in Ashraf Salim. It actually is the tribunal that that group in that configuration hits first. Um, but I wanted to play it because it's the one time that we kept in this third person. Um, and for me, it speaks to then, I guess, as I'm encountering Brad and Karen's work, something I wanted to tease out, which is the voice of the doctor. So, if you can start with that, and we'll just play a little bit of it. Stop. Summarized answers in response to questions by the tribunal members. Why did you go with the Taliban when they came to you? The detainee states that he was grocery shopping close to his house and the Taliban was drafting people. When he was in the store, the Taliban came and asked for him. When he stated his identity, they put a sheet around his hands and tied them with the sheet and captured him. And then what did they do? The detainee states that they threw him in a car, they drove around about an hour and then stopped at a house. They knocked on the door. The detainee could not hear what was said, but he assumed they asked for the dad. When they knocked on the door, the kids came and they asked where their father was. In the meantime, the detainee saw they were far away and tried to escape. The detainee jumped from the car. They came back and threw him back in the car and then took him to Kandahar. Another town, Sangin, then to Kandahar, from Kandahar to Kabul, then to Narim. Were your hands tied the whole time? The detainee states that until they reached Kandahar, his hands were tied. After Kandahar, his hands were released. What happened after that? The detainee states that they spent one to two nights in Kandahar and then one to two nights in Kabul. Were the guards with you all of the time? The detainee states the guards were with him all the time. They didn't give him... They didn't just give him to the driver and tell the driver to take him. There were two Taliban in the car with the detainee. Were they armed? The detainee states, yes, they were armed. Okay. You if you had walked away from them, what do you think? Thank you. 
We're just getting chairs and we'll have a discussion in just a minute. I think, uh, is this on? Yeah, okay. Um, I think we're going to just carry on, really. And um, it's nice that a discussion's already started without us. <laughs> I'm always there. Uh, but um, I think I feel provoked in a, in a really, um, really quite profound way to just offer this as a way of opening up the space. Um, just to say thank you both. Um, really, really very powerful. Um, and I suppose what it brings to mind for me is how I personally um, think about uh, the space of what we're discussing around very deep, very complex issues around participation and non-participation. But to think about this in both, not as an, uh, so to think about participation not as an ameliorative, this kind of smooth space that it's a kind of space of, of conflict, it's a space of uncomfort, discomfort. And that is actually a space that we do need to be in and is as a productive space. So I know that maybe not all of us might find that comfortable to be in an uncomfortable or discomfort, but I suppose that's one of the things that I was interested in wanting to try and at least excavate what non-participation is to try and think about this place of where to start from, from that position of being uncomfortable and to, to, to look at things which are really painful. So that's what I'd like to just say by way of opening. And the only other thing I'd like to say, I've got loads of notes, I'm sure Brad's got millions, because his brain functions even faster than mine. Um, and, but, um, um, but also we really do, and I say that one, we're taking up a position of authority, we're re-performing the things that we're always trying to work against, which is us as experts. None of us here are experts. Um, and audience, we're all experts, we're all audience. So I would genuinely really like to open up a discussion as soon as we can, so it isn't just our voices that we hear echoing. I don't know if you want to say anything else, Brad. I'd quite like to draw on the board. Can I do do that for a sec? No, no. I, I, can I draw over the top? It's okay. Is there chalk? Can you hear me without this for a second? Just one second, because it's quite hard to do this. It's just. It's. It's not a fully formed thought. It's a sort of process of hearing the two presentations and um, feeling quite deeply affected by them and trying to find a way to talk about the tension between them also. And, and so I wrote in my sketchbook, I was kind of working... So I'll just explain, uh, that should say author authority is a way to sort of um, place some ideas uh, that struck me in this. And it kind of actually goes like this. So one side would be freedom, on the other side would be the permanent war.
And maybe it'll be enough just to explain what I mean by those and, and why I think that there's a tension between the two papers. But uh, this is kind of not quite verbatim correct, but it's this idea of freedom. That liberty is a founding and legitimizing principle of the United States. And liberalism is a whole way of being and thinking. It is a type of relation between the governors and the governed, where disputes between individuals and government look like the problem of freedoms. In other words, the demand for liberalism founds the state, rather than the state limiting itself through liberalism. So in other words, so the United States, it's one of the things I've been sort of feeling and experience is the idea of where freedom and liberty exists as a sense of a kind of utopian process or dream. Uh, and it's something that I felt Avery was touching on to some extent. And then this idea of permanent war, which is not my idea, it comes from the Monument Group. But it talks about how the main feature of the contemporary permanent war is that it does not contain the concept of peace as its political condition. Rather, such a permanent war intends the erasure of the political subjects. And I felt that very much in these incredible testimonies, which don't allow their people, participants, to be political subjects. It does anything but it erodes their ability to be able to speak. And, and somehow, I suppose, <coughs> I wanted just to bring that in because uh, I felt that with the sign and with the Urdu, and a lot of the work we do is outside the United States. And so when you're outside the US working, uh, I felt that there was this sense of where uh, freedom lies in the consciousness of a utopian uh, idea, and then this experience of permanent war that I feel that I would contend we all live in. And um, it's been an education to be able to hear and be in the United States and think about that from this vantage point because mostly when you're from outside, my experience is that uh, people connect these two things and when on the, they're on the wrong end of it, it's an incredible um, anger results, I would say. So it was just my initial response and reply. Could we start to gather people, if you have questions, to put your hands up or thoughts? Or... I mean, one of the things also, while people are, are collecting questions, which I, I hope also you'll feel, it's like a dense, a dense room, and I hope uh, you can kind of uh, stick into it. Um, I think there is something interesting for me, and I am one of the things that was exciting for me to try to, in a condensed way, bring the CSRT public reading into this space was to try to think through, even though as a collaborative we thought through a lot of things about it, but to, to, to think about the ways in which this question of participation functions because it's constantly referred to, like, do you want to participate or not? The detainees were given the option to participate in the CRSTs, CRS the option, or not, and half elected not to. The ones that we have as, as this kind of transcript that I read are the ones that at some point or on some level chose to participate. And, and I think what, Brad, you're talking about in terms of a disabling or what you said, they're constantly being kept from political subjecthood, um, and in that way disabled in speech, but that's their speech also disables for me, or, or goes a long way to disable these tribunals. Of course, that's something that is complicated because the tribunals have had defining power. I mean, the, the tribunals and them, these detainees being, only 38 of 550 were determined to no longer be enemy combatants. So the vast majority, of course, were determined to be enemy combatants. But those tribunals represented the first time that they were, they were released to the public by the Department of Defense against their will through a Freedom of Information Act. They represented the first time that lawyer, lawyers um, who were not in contact with an individual detainee, there were only a few who had had detainees who were working with lawyers at the time could actually analyze these to understand who was there, what countries were they from, what ages were they, because none of that information was accessible. And, and now I, I do think the tribunals continue, these documents continue to play a, a role in disabling the system. So I just wanted to also 
have they disabled the system? No, mm. but I just wanted to put out that it's maybe a kind of complicated, that the, the, the yeah, a complicated. Yeah, no, I'm just gonna echo back. I mean, I just wrote it down from, from your presentation. Excessive participation to disable the forum. Um, and as you were speaking then, I was thinking about, you know, the, the word tribunal. Um, and I was thinking a bit about the sort of history of tribunals. And um, so the tribunal as sort of peoples, a participatory peoples tribunal. But in this case, the, these sorts of, that's a tribunal, it's a military tribunal. And how all of these uh, conflations of, of like what is a forum, a court, a trial, an agora, you know, is, is just... A hearing, yeah, it's just, um, you know, I mean, there's so many just absolutely chilling things um, in wh what you just presented. The proceeding is going to go on with or without you, you know, so what the tribunal gets constructed, you know, on, you know, I mean, but it, it's not functioning as, as in the history of tribunals as a participatory people's tribunal, you know, um, the most recent one being the one on Iraq in 2003, the Brussels Tribunal, which comes from the history of the, which is the, the first one in the Vietnam? Um, the, Russell, the Russell Tribunal, which was Sartre and other uh, writers and, you know. I mean, one thing just to say that you're, you're talking about the, um, the voice of the documents here and I mean, one of the things that's very clear when you, when you listen to these, also when you read the 19th century court cases as well, um, is of course the complete corruptibility and malleability of the law can be made to mean all kinds of things. If, I mean, partially for me, the reference to the older history of slavery in the United States is to precisely reflect on whose history understands the relationship between the exception and the rule. In other words, that the exception is in fact quite rarely the case. The particular distinction between the legal and the administrative that is evoked in this military tribunal was actually a legal dis distinction applied to prisoners in the civilian prisons by the Warren Court in an attempt to essentially disable the Eighth Amendment which protects prisoners from cruel and unusual punishment. And the way that this was done over the years of that, not the Warren Court, the Rehnquist Court, excuse me, through a series of cases was to redefine things that had been considered punishment within the prison as administrative security and so this becomes enshrined in a series of Supreme Court cases that give to the prison wardens authorities that they had not held before. So the Supreme Court defers to them on all kinds of things and allows the prison to redefine um, all kinds of things as administrative as opposed to in the punishment category. The, everything that happens in the military tribunals and that happens in general to the prisoners in Guantanamo is all, um, I mean, the laboratory of that is the U.S. prison. The majority population who is subject to that starting exactly at the end of the Civil War when black people become the majority prison population, <laughs> I mean, this connection goes very deep. Um, and so I think for me, I don't, I don't see a conflict between what Sh Sharon was saying or the nine scripts for a nation at war piece, which I know very well, and what I was saying, or at least I, I don't know if you feel there was. I, I don't feel that at, at all. Um, I think that one thing we could talk about, which you raised, Sharon, which I think is very interesting, is what is the voice of the document? I mean, the... There was, a, the, there was a group of abolitionist lawyers and judges in Minneapolis who used the habeas corpus, the right of the judge, to essentially issue um, a habeas corpus writ to produce, for someone to be produced before him, the habeas corpus writ, produce the body. I mean, that's essentially what it means. This writ was, this was a strategy 
that the abolitionists used quite successfully in Minneapolis. So the judge issued an, an order that the sheriffs should bring, in this case, Eliza before him to the court. And so they bring her to the court, and he says to her, do you want to be free? <laughs> the Farrah Griffin, do you want to be free? And she says, I do. And he says, okay, there we go. And so, I mean, none of these, these court proceedings, however, are recorded in the court registers. They do not record them, the judges do not record them because they don't want any record of them. And so the, 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 the false invitation to participate or not, the false choice, is in fact what the voice of the document to me more than anything else enunciates. In my case, we have hidden documents, people keeping things secret. Frederick Douglass, eat your pass. Eat it. It can't be found. We don't, no records are to be found. You want to hide the records. The secret is, in fact, what protects. And so, I mean, this is something, I mean, we could talk more about that, but that raises a question about different strategies in relationship to documents and to modalities of, of disempowerment. I have a question about language. So it's not a deep question, but it's just, um, how did you come up with the Urdu text for the, for the translation? It's a very deep question. <laughs> Because it goes back to it goes back to um, goes back to this question about translation, and um, so uh, you know the Urdu comes from um, being in in Pakistan um, during the height of um, the lawyers' movement. So just arriving there um, un unknowingly, what in terms of what was going on politically, socially. Um, and the invitation came to cross the border from India to Pakistan. And um, so that came through various different conversations. Um, there's a, I don't know if anyone knows um, Karachi, the city, very well, but the city is um, inscribed. It's, it's, it's textual. It's written. Everyone writes on the walls. And you might, you know, there's, it's, it's not like an alternative form of advertising. It's a form of communication with the city. Um, that is very mutable, very flexible, and in certain places it's very illegal. So in the sort of, you know, the sort of really elite spaces, it's constantly being whitewashed. But a lot of the city is left with these kind of traces of, 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 of language, of communication, and slogans, political slogans. So we knew very early on that we were going to work with this, the space of the city intervening with the fabrics of these boundary lines between what is predominantly, I'm sorry if that's a little bit of a long narrative, but um, boundary lines between what is very elite and what is very, very dispossessed, because there's not a huge middle class. The middle class in, in Pakistan is in the UK, it's in America, it's in, you know, <laughs> um, we're, you know. Um, so um, in relationship to different parts of geography of the city, um, and different my communities and yeah communities uh, we started to have conversations about different the, that tra the translation so we had a, a playwright to translate it I'm a friend uh, uh, and so we had long discussions and arguments over what use of language and then we had different and then the bet the, the kind of one of the most interesting conversations was with with the sign writer which was a very pious man and we had a long conversation about what the sign, what the, what it meant, how it could be translated, and what it meant to put it into a public space, because also he was a man that did not want to commit blasphemy. Um, so, the 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 linguistic, the one that we chose, which um, you could say was probably one that might be more accessible and more popular use of language, was Lata Luki Kar Agaibja, which means when that's translated back into Roman English means the house of the unexpected. And we were just like... Could I add a very small... Yeah. Just, a, just a tiny footnote. And part of the interest was that there was no way of using the word museum without it being an import. So... Um, and then one other thing to think about was where the word museum comes from. We're very interested. And we took it back to the, its original etymology, which was from the Greek 
And um, if you really follow it through, we got very interested in the idea of museums without walls. If we go back into that, I don't want to, I don't want to take too much time on the microphone, but uh, so how can you work with a concept like participation, which is deep within this sort of current art discourse in the UK, participatory art and social um, art, where that funding comes from and have this imported term and being a city which doesn't itself have a museum of modern art you start to turn it into the museum. The, the, the city becomes the museum, and it becomes a museum of these boundaries and terms. Sorry. Okay. Can I just talk? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I have a question about the connections between the two papers. Um, the general were great. Um, there seems to be also a sort of running connection in terms of the politics of non-participation and the cost of participation in really different sort of historical moments. You know, for Avery, it's, you know, the moment of the slave state, what it means to participate in that, is to participate in uh, unfreedom for so many people, but also non-participation means to be part of an abolitionist, you know, cause. And for sharing this paper, it's, you know, that participation is to sort of surrender one's body to the military administrative tribunal and to non-participate to try to extract yourself so I was wondering if you could talk about you know, what's at stake for you in participation and non-participation and how that's actually a pretty political you know, maneuver. It's not non-participation as a sort of retreat from politics. <laughs> I mean, I think that for me, I do think that um, that there that one of the things that um, we could use this term to signify non-participation is, and I tried to give a kind of a long list of a variety of things that might constitute, um, in that sense, political non-participation of various forms. But there, for me, what's important about it is. Um, maybe almost a kind of continuum. There are different ways to, in effect, be in a state of non-participation, and some of them are more extreme than others. Um, so to run away as a slave is, um, as I say, <laughs> requires a lot of preparation, and I mean, this is not an easy form of non-participation. Um, to, um, there are others that are easier and more easier to do from within, um, if you like, what appears to be um, an illusion of participation. So, I mean, but I think what's really important is to some extent the, the, um, the state of mind to some extent um, in terms of how to think about what it is politically. And there, the disinvestment in the terms or regime of order is for me really the crucial thing. Um, so one begins to not participate the moment one begins to disinvest, um, both from the harms but also from the lures, the promises. And that's I think um, even people who are confined, and I mean, I've done most of my recent research is on prison and imprisonment on prisoners, and there, of course, is really a sort of extraordinary model of almost um, the paradigm state of being of abolition, which is, of course, you must free yourself while you are enslaved. And so this notion that you have to be free to get free and all of that is just completely irrelevant. You don't have any choice but to do it in that context. So what does that mean? You know, how does a prisoner find some kind of modality of freedom that isn't just escape from within that position of confinement? And some of it has to do with developing forms of indifference that for me are about literally being indifference in the evoking that sense of the non-normative that, that Sharon began with, but that is also 
evoking this idea of being indifferent. You don't give a shit, really, about them. So you're not invested in the perpetuation of things. And that, that space of desire, to me, politically, is very crucial to the idea of non-participation, right? So I don't know if that helps, but... Um, I can, I can be very, very quick, which is to say I think that uh, in a way if the administrative tribunal continues whether the detainee is actually present or not, then the participation, the showing up at the tribunal, I feel like something else happens that, that is, is, is maybe, as Avery just adds it in now, a kind of it being indifference, like that something else is going on. There's um, the, <laughs> the case, the case at the end when I, I mentioned someone named Setha. This is the name of a character in a Toni Morrison novel, mm -hmm. Beloved, and that's um, based on a true case of Margaret Garner, who was a slave woman from Cincinnati who did indeed kill one of her children. Um, and it was a rather celebrated case um, again, also around um, questions of personhood and the law. I mean, that's a whole other topic that's actually quite interesting in relationship to, to the tribunals because there the question of whether you are um, an enemy combatant or not is really a question of your status as a person. Are you a person or not? Are, it, it's a moment in which the law decides to make or unmake you as a person. Okay, so the context that the Eliza Winston case takes place in is very important, the Dred Scott decision, because that is, for those of you who remember your, your school history, was the important decision that voided the Missouri Compromise in which the federal government claimed that there could be non-slave territories and states. But more importantly, it ruled that every person of African descent could never be a citizen. So when William Taylor makes an ad that says, we welcome citizens and strangers, that notion of the stranger is very, very clear who that, who that is, who that's addressed to. And so in the Margaret Garner case as well, the lawyers attempted to have her tried for murder because to try her for murder meant in effect a legal judgment that she was a person and not a form of property et cetera, et cetera. Um, my general sense from what I know is that there was perhaps less infanticide than we think there might have been. Um, some. Um, the, um, I see that in some ways, yes, about an extreme form of non-participation, death. It's a little bit like the hunger strikers who go on death strike. That is to say, they, they strike to die. And the Guantanamo prisoners, their models were the Irish the prisoners, Bobby Sands and the IRA, and those hunger strikes which they knew about in part through the Turkish connection. I mean, that's a whole other story about how prisoners know about these things. Um, death seems to me, um, yes, you could say a political act of non-participation, extreme in the sense that it's not necessarily um, a kind of collective strategy that um, should be, I think, encouraged. It's necessary sometimes, perhaps. I don't judge it in that sense, I guess I would say, but I would hope that we could do better in terms of forms of political strategy that were not so destructive. But I don't know if I'm quite addressing your question. Um. Uh. 
Hi. I've been fortunate to study also the Quran and uh, various forms of theologies and language, especially um, Arabic. And one of the things that I started thinking while we were listening to the transcripts was Surah 4, verses 135 through 136 on justice. Um, and it's one of the hadiths, which is a prophetic, a prophetic statement, which is, excuse me, I lost my place. Giving judgment is such a tremendous affair in which there is no place for hopefully, perhaps, or maybe. This is because whoever has judged has decreed, and a decree is something that is done by God or an apostle of God, by the permission of God, or in accordance with principles set down in Revelation. It is not something to be undertaken lightly. When someone decrees, they must carefully balance the worldly circumstances against what has come down in Revelation and what has been demonstrated through the examples of the prophets. So judgment can... So judgment without reference to higher realities and subduing of the ego can result in a type of tyranny. I started thinking about the transcript and how words and translation and, and transcription, interpretation, how you can go from what the actual detainee said and how it actually evolves into the romantic English and what is the reality that is created on that text and if you were to look at it in front of you in whatever font, and the bold words that come out, participation, non-participation, administrative hearing, combative, you know, all these words, creating an alternative reality, what do you think um, that says about us as a society? And then the second, second um, that we allowed this to happen under our watch. And I think about the karmic retribution that we're going to have as allowing this. And I'm very happy to hear that there's a hunger strike because maybe this will wake people up. Second point, the other night when we were performing, one of the audience members got up and wanted to use restorative justice as a mechanism, as a tool for people to dialogue and we were so against that, collectively. It did not work. I think that says a lot as well. That spoke very loud to me. That's it. I mean, that's maybe a question we could all try to answer. I'm not sure I have any, no, I'm not sure I have any purchase on the, the answer to the first question. Yeah. I mean, I just would like to, I don't know, I feel, um, I like that uh, makes me think of no because I mean these conversations back to um, the voice of the document and the text and the translation and, and, and this kind of because um, this piece over here and I'm not just doing some like self promotional thing but it started as a conversation you know there's four UN resolutions on the wall and it started with a conversation with a with a friend a colleague, a fellow, you know, I mean, life citizen, who um, is half Iraqi and half French. Um, she comes from a. Uh, her father was the founder of the Ba'athist Party in, in Iraq and left before Saddam joined. And the conversation started with very simple: you can just look at take four resolutions, and just within four resolutions, you can map the whole sociocide. And so that sort of conversation, it just never left me, never left us. So when you start to talk about and think about the voice of the document, and within that, each resolution is just one sentence, one grammatical sentence. So look at the sentence there. That's when Kuwait, you know, um, when Iraq invades Kuwait. Look at that one there, it's one sentence. That's the illegal occupation, you know. And so just starting to think about the construction of the memo, the legal language, the passing through, the kind of, you know, like when you were talking about these detainees in the language itself, I mean, what can you possibly do any more than just read it out? It's the most absurdist, you know, like uh, f fiction that you could possibly imagine when you just hear the proximity of the detainees speak and the you know, the sort of uh, administrative. And so for me, I started to think about 
the UN, which I, you know, I fundamentally am, you know, totally still and utterly an anguished optimist, so I still believe in the United Nations, I still believe in humanity, I still believe, but how can all these forces, these actors, these agents, these things that we talk about, the, the internal, external, us as oppressors and oppressed, oprimidos, how can all of those things from, you know, the Second World War to now turn a, a humanitarian project into a killing machine? Into the very act where the, muse the Museum of Non-Participation is the UN? I mean, those are the kind of things that I'm sort of... But so, so in that moment, if the UN is the Museum of Non-Participation, then how do we resist, struggle, come together, practice solidarity, speak? You know, because... Like I said, I'm still an anguished optimist. And probably most of us in this room are, because we're still here, and it's quite a heavy Saturday afternoon. <laughs> the ones that want to play on a, or go shopping are, you know, are not with us at the moment, are they? It's just a small thought I hadn't thought of until you started speaking about a little bit about the performance, too. And um, one of the... Oh, I, let's see if I can do it in a short way, but... Um, for a while, we, Karen and I, in our practice, have thought about how our very imagination feels colonized and our words of resistance um, feel like they, they don't hit home because the people in power aren't listening to the, the uh, truth as presented. And so we, we've been thinking very hard about whether we could find new languages of resistance which come out of the body and move towards speech in a way. And so a lot of the problems and the ways we think are about how documents speak, how authority is an author who writes histories. And um, one of the problems I noticed in the performance yesterday, um, as we start to evaluate what happened, was we created these moments where anyone could override the whole system and structure of the performance by clapping their hands and shouting, freeze. And then you could say anything you wanted to. In a way, it's a bit like grabbing the microphone here. Um, and it was a very interesting um, process. And one of the things I felt that was tied within it was in the very act of speaking your truth, you were also silencing everyone else in the room. And, and uh, I, so I still think, and maybe we were talking about that a bit at dinner last night, weren't we, about this, this, this tension between um, how we listen, how we hear, who speaks, where it comes from, and then who is silenced in that in, in extreme process of actually taking that moment, if you like. And somewhere in there, I, uh, you remind me. I, I would kind of like to respond to this a, a little bit and, and just put a bit of a provocation. We're coming towards the end. One of the, um, the, um, the detainees in one of the transcripts that Sharon read said justice requires discussion and I actually disagree completely with that really to be honest. Um, justice requires a redistribution of power and authority. You can have it with or without a great deal of discussion to be honest. Um, and so the, the, the question I think that um, we face politically at this moment in time which for me in many ways the the continuities of the abolition movement in terms of the abolition of slavery, debt indenture, prison. I mean, there's, there's a long history of abolition as a framework for political participation um, and really in some ways for um, political change. We have now gotten to, I think, the point where lots of fake participation or even genuine participation by people in the conventional, formal, given political processes do not produce just outcomes. Millions of people demonstrated before the ground war evasion of Iraq took place against it. That was quite one of the most unprecedented things we had seen in a long time, that is to say a protest against a war like that before it even took place, at least the groundwork. Okay, so we had already had a war there since 1991. Um, it really made no difference. And so we, we now come to, I think, um, not so much a new place, but a new place for many people's memories. There are older, 
older moments when this also happened, in which we might really have to think that, um, that looking to the law, looking to the state, looking to the given institutions to give us the answers, to give justice, to render justice in the, in the conventional legal sense, may be in fact um, impossible at this point in time. What then kind of politics are required? Then you get to something very, very different. Um, I mean, you may need a human strike. You may need all kinds of things that involve becoming maybe your own authority. Brad put the word authority up there. I might have put the word um, autonomy up there um, in terms of things that I think are very difficult for, for folks to imagine that in fact you have the power to make um, not, you don't have the power to get them to do a whole bunch of things they don't want to do. Probably not. But you do have power to, in that sense, secede from their terms. The question of whether anybody's willing to do that or not, and what is involved in that, I think that's, that's the political pro provocation, in a sense, that, um, that uh, you can see when you begin in a place where people were enslaved, had to run away. And I emphasized walking because people walked thousands of miles by foot to do that. Okay, like they literally had to go and make some other life, every act of which was a, a criminal act. So that's, I mean, that would be the provocation I would kind of push towards the end. I just want to pause and say I think there's a kind of texture and richness here that I think we could go on for a long time but just for the sake of time maybe one more question and then we'll all be around for our conversation uh, I'm glad that you mentioned the word autonomy just because what's sort of in the back of my head with all of this too is um, particularly the Italian autonomist movement um, specifically. And I'm thinking particularly here about Mario Tronti and how he writes what he calls a strategy of refusal. And so his notion of refusal, I think, is really quite interesting in this discussion simply because his idea of refusal is not, I mean, this is in the context of um, the Italian labor movement in the 1960s, but his idea of refusal is not a refusal of work. He believes in this idea of working, of acting, right? But, the, but particularly what he's saying is that there's, there's a particular kind of action. So I'm thinking to Sharon then about when you're talking about this detainee who is continually asked if he's going to participate, right? And there's not really necessarily a refusal, but it's a refusal of a sort of participation, right? There is the continual, um, I mean, it, what's really wonderful about it is the kind of absurdity that just comes from just talking, just continuing to talk, even though he's not participating in the formal sense. And what I, what I find interesting then too is how it is that the Italian labor movement then took up this idea of non-participation by really integrating a particular kind of completely absurdist action into the, um, into the factory, right? It means that they will act, they will continue to work, but they will do it on a you know, remarkably slowed down pace so that it really screws up everything else within the system, right? Or they will continue to act, but they will, you know, spontaneously start to do just cartwheels throughout the, you know, throughout the factory or something like that. So what I think is interesting is that, you know, it's not so much this idea of not, of complete withdrawal, you know, complete, like not acting, but it is not acting in the way that it's necessarily prescribed, so. Although their children have no work, and so their politics are really different, right? And they are really also about rejecting work in the conventional sense because it doesn't exist for them. And so in some ways, I mean, Karen's involved with the, you know, people who think of themselves as precarious in this sense or itinerant in one way or another. And there, I mean, the, the old honor of being against work but for it as your very being. Now this is, I think, to be, to be left behind in a good way, possibly. You know, that we'll have to think about what work means in a different context. I just wanted to, um, not a closing thought, but I just wanted something I wanted to share, um, which is um, about implication. And um, because this work of um, Boal's has been on a very personal level and a political and on an aesthetic level, it's been really important. 
And um, so we've, we've been practicing uh, Boel's Theatre of the Oppressed, uh, weekly workshops in London uh, for the last year and a half. And I have to say, uh, it was an un incredible privilege to be able to work with the players and <laughs> here in Twin, in, um, Twin Cities on the, on the play. That's another conversation. But um, Francis Rifkin, who's the theatre director, who's also studied with Boel, who has been training myself, us, uh, um, there was a moment when we were making these body images and she, because she's someone who's been active, you know, and used political theatre, um, you know, in the 70s, miners strikes, steel workers strikes and all of it, you know, anti-fascist struggles, the whole thing. And um, she was like, wow, she basically read our body images. We'd all made, we were a very, very, very diverse group of people, age, geographies, everything. We'd all made images where we were implicated in this play of oppressor and oppressed. And she was like, that for her fractured, her kind of work of working in the 60s and the 70s, and then working, because she's continued all the way through uh, to now. So anyway, that kind of relation, and, that's, and then we sort of collectivized ourselves, because initially it was the hierarchy of institution, artist, uh, curator, community. Uh, and within this process of working together, we kind of threw that away, uh, took hold of the budget collectively, and called ourselves implicated theatre. <laughs> um, anyway, I just wanted to just bring that in in terms of what we've been talking about today, refusal and implication and all these things. That's